I asked Cindy not to put it on the table because I don't want anybody to take what I wrote and think that that is the example. It's just what is it? It's if Tim Waters was doing this, how would he come at it? That's all it is. And at the end of the day, we're not interested in Tim Waters' vision. It's not nearly as important as the collective vision, right? Shared vision isn't one that somebody writes and we share with the community. It's <coughs> one we build together, right? So to the degree that anything that I wrote, I specifically wrote about that table, and most of you wouldn't be surprised why. <laughs> but to the degree that what I did is useful, great. If it's not, just forget about it. But if you want to see an example, at least that the title reflects what we're talking about as a vision for long run, I written one. Now let me see. I'm going to go here. <coughs> and, and here's where I, here's how I, this here's how I thought about this. And when I talk about vision, and I talk about it probably more frequently than most people would like to hear, um, this is kind of what is in my head. So this is what my brain does. That it, it should be inspirational. It should be, it should be a, a, a future-oriented, as tangible and concrete as, as you can make it, and as unique as it can be for what you're envisioning for the future. And it's, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a uh, description of a future state. Not how we're going to get there, not the activities in which we're going to be involved. It's what does it look and feel like when we're successful? Right? That's the intent, at least in my head. It may not be for you. I'm just saying, when you see my example, I just want you to know what the thinking about it. And then doing that, for me, it, it really takes some, some considerations of a couple of other thoughts. One, like what's the look and feel in the long run? And two, what it's going to take ultimately, if you think about this, the kind of collective action that will be required of us as a community to actually realize that vision. So as you, as you apply yourself to the narrative, I hope you'll be thinking about what's it going to be like for us collectively to work together on something that matters to our future. Now, when I, when I draft and when I draft, my the most um, helpful, friendly, our critical friends <coughs> in my life is my wife. So I don't ever take anything out of that saying, Jane, would you take a look at this? And in her, actually, the person who does the best editing on my work is Marsha, but my, my, my wife uh, is, is, is not resident or uh, reticent at all to give me really constructive approval. So she read what I wrote and said, people are going to make people sick, it's way too lofty, it's not achievable. And I thought, uh, you know, I don't, that's not that's not the way I come at it. But you may look at it and say, this is too loud. It's it's too airy fairy or whatever, right? The intent again is not to, to use my as, as a as a model, other than one example. But here's here's the other thing that occurs to me. And I hope you'll at least consider this as you as you work on the vision for the future. The, 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 uh, this is a paraphrase of a statement made by Dee Hawk. Do I know who Dee Hawk is? Not a test. He just was one of the great visionary you know, corporate leaders in the world. He was the founder of Visa. Now, whether you like Visa or not, as a corporation is not a question. It became, at the time, the most successful virtual corporation on the planet. Maybe Amazon competes with it today, but he was way ahead of his time. And, and when he talked about vision and goal setting, you know, and, 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 and being too lofty with your, your vision of the future. He makes this statement, that failure is not falling short of what you wanted to realize. It is failing to realize everything you might achieve. Right. So when you read mine and it's too lofty, put it aside. But challenge yourselves to be as ambitious, as, um, as transformational as you can be with your thinking about the future. Whether you buy this or not is up to you. For me, <coughs> It's how I'm going to continue to come at this, and I hope at least you'll give consideration, you know, to what inspires our community. It sets the stage for us to work collectively moving forward. So Sandy has, if you, if, if anybody wants them, she'll have them. If you don't want them, ignore it. I just wanted you to have the background of what I <coughs> learned and all the So I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. You're going to give us the lay of the land <coughs> as we go through the day. Understand a couple things. You are, you are working as a proxy right now for the community. We understated the first time we met how rigorous we intend public engagement to be around the product of what you're creating. Sandy will talk about what we're going to do with the table. 
and how we're going to move your work into the community and give the community not just a chance to react, but to contribute to where we end up with a sheer vision. We'll talk more about that later today. The last question to you will be, what's, what's next? What have we missed? Well, well, what are the next steps you think we need to be taking? So we need your best thinking on that as well. I'm Dr. Sandy. All right, thanks, Tim. Well, if you weren't inspired by that on a Friday morning, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I take it from here. Um, so there were some agendas as you came into the door. There's also one on every table to kind of go through how we're going to talk about this today. You may remember at the last meeting, for those of you who were at the last meeting, that we did a whole big brainstorming. Some of it was geographic, where we said we think we'd like to see this here or that here or something else here. And some of it was more esoteric, um, you know, around different kinds of um, neighborhoods and themes that could emerge from this effort. All of those have been captured in this document. You have several of them on your table. There's three or four of them that are on your table. This document then was broken up by category into eight categories, which are now the eight tables that you see here um, today. So just to kind of tell you what happened with your feedback, it's on this particular piece here. We captured everything, both geographically and all the different sticky notes and categorized them into these areas. So as promised, what we said we would do at today's meeting is just start to talk conceptually about what does that look like? What are some visual representations of the types of things that you talked about? It's really important to note that what you're about to see is, is not a, um, well, it's not set, right? Today, the idea is to try to get your feedback around what kinds of things you said last time and whether that still works today. So you'll notice that there's a map of what Daniel's going to show you on each of your tables and markers. And the reason is because this is not a set plan. This is not something that has been adopted, approved, and ready to go. In fact, some of you may see properties that you own with something else on there than you envisioned. <laughs> Who knows? But there are some markers for you to be able to mark up, um, to be able to say, well, here's really what we need to see in this area or that area, but trying to put some meat on the vision that you all had. So here's where your feedback happened. The, the graphic representation is, uh, I'm going to actually introduce Tony, who's going to talk a little bit about Daniel, and then we're going to actually show you some flyovers and some work that the city staff and our consultant has done. At the end of Daniel's presentation is when we will have you start to mark up on your maps and have some conversation around, okay, what do we love about this and what do we have concerns about this? Um, where can we see ourselves plugging into these different types of concepts? Um, and then at that point, we'll take a little break and write the narratives that Tim is talking about. So those things happen kind of in that order. First, you'll see the ideas, see what's there today, see what could be there tomorrow. You'll be able to have feedback on what that looks like and then we'll write some vision statements in these particular areas. The public involvement process to this happens after this meeting. Once we get another set of visuals based on y'all's feedback, that's what we'll start taking out to the community in lots of different ways, starting May 1st and ending at the end of July to try to really get lots of other feedback into, into what does that mean. So this process doesn't end today either, as, as Tim kind of alluded to. A couple of quick housekeeping things. More tragic than the AV not working, neither did the coffee pot. <laughs> so, we now have coffee in the back um, that Maria ran out and grabbed for folks, and so it's over in the carton of caffeine. So, feel free to take care of yourself today. We have lots of snacks and brain food. We got salmon, thinking that that might be good brain food for you, um, as well as bagels and, and cream cheese and fruit. And then now there's caffeine. Bathrooms are right outside the door and to the left. Please just take care of yourselves today. Um, we're going to have a great session, and I look forward to seeing all the things that, that you come up with today. So. With that, turn over to Tony. Thank you. So I'm Tony Chacon, I'm the redevelopment manager. And uh, what we decided to uh, do is based on the conversations at the last get together and the various ideas and notes, uh, we thought it would be uh, interesting to put some visual character to these ideas so that we can get better feedback. So with that, we thought it was extremely important to get a, an understanding of what we're working with today out in this particular area. So given the short time we had between the last meeting and this meeting, what we did is we've kind of shortened up the focus area initially. And the, the focus area was actually shaped in part by the comments we received. So there was a, a massing of comments in an area primarily from about Martin back to South Pratt Parkway. So that's where we uh, did this initial focus. Uh, our interest may go beyond that here with uh, 
uh, forthcoming endeavors. So we brought on, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Daniel Tall, who's gonna be pushing buttons for me. <laughs> so Daniel uh, is with DHM, they're a consulting firm. Uh, his particular expertise is in modeling and drone technology. And so we had him go out and do some drone flights of the area to show us what the existing conditions are so you get a perspective there. Now, on each of your tables there, you will see a package of aerials. Those are for your use. It's a resource to get perspective of the area as we go through this, uh, this planning endeavor here. So with that, we're just gonna go through the aerials and then we're gonna go into showing you how development might phase in over time. And let me just express, what you're gonna see in the modeling, these are dimensions based upon product that actually gets built based on the product type that's mentioned there. So whether it's multifamily, commercial, or whatever. Uh, even you will see that we, we're showing a performance venue. And that performance venue, for example, was modeled on similar scale to other performance venues throughout the metro area, the Denver metro area. So it wasn't just that we came in and threw blocks on the map and said, hey, you can put a building here and this is what it might look like. So there's some level of reality to what these massings might be. And that's the other thing to remember too, that these, this is just a massing study. This does not show any level of detail or articulation. So a lot of things can be done to really enhance what these blocks might actually look like. So always keep that in mind also. So that, we're gonna take you through a, a, a study of the existing conditions, and I'm gonna try and describe the orientation. So the first shot here, anybody get stuck which direction we're looking? What was the clue? Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> a lot of people out of state, they still haven't caught on to the aspect that this, you know you're going west when you see the mountains. So this is Boston Avenue, more recently built. Uh, to the far side over there is that uh, area that is to be preserved as a natural area and park. And to the, this side of the uh, Boston is a large undeveloped parcel that was part of the Butterball. Actually, uh, Brian Bear's group currently has ownership of that. And then here in the near distance, you will see just the scattering of it's basically like storage yards and so forth. And then we have other uh, uses there. We have a, uh, a rent center there and some ancillary buildings as part of that. Next one. Hey, Tony. Yeah. you have a corner that you can point out that you have through this stuff? Uh, I wish I did. Have some... to know where you're talking about. Some of yeah, I might have to just, if okay, I stand in front of the screen to kind of point. <laughs> that was something I forgot. Sure. We can't find it. Looks like Sean's going to go take a look, see what we can find. <clears throat> so again, this is another view. Again, this is the parcel here that was part of the Butterball, owned by Brian Bear's company. And this whole area over here, this mass over here, is that open natural area. And we'll have parts of that will be part of elements. And as we get move further west, kind of gives you a better perspective of some of the conditions we have over there. <clears throat> so one of the concerns we have is a lot of these uses in here, over time have most probably been contributing some conditions to the environment that aren't acceptable. So we've got junk cars, we have maybe fuel that's been spilled, we have uh, antifreezes that can have been spilled, all sorts of noxious uses, so we don't know so during the flood, for example, we can only imagine what might have come off that site towards the river. So one thing is, is this something we would like to maintain or is this something we would like to strive to change into the future? Just another perspective, this one looking north. And this is, again, looking west. Now, this is looking right along the River Creek border here. I have a laser pointer for you, but uh, where is your computer? Way over there. Okay. Do I have to do something here? Can I keep talking in the meantime? Keep talking. <laughs> so again, here's the, what happens, the park area is back in here. 
we have an existing use. This is an event center, kind of an open space event center. And then this is that rental center. And then the, this is Boston. Here's a remnant parcel that was, uh, oh, it's now owned by the city that was part of the Boston extension uh, and was not needed for the roadway itself. But you can see here the improvements currently underway along the river where there was a mobile home park up here. And now you can see where the river corridor was in this vicinity, we are now way wider than what it was originally. So when completed, the river alignment will be totally different. It's actually shifted, I understand, to the north slightly from where it was previously. So that whole area in there is dramatically changing just as a result of the various storm improvements that are going on at this time. Um, immediately up here in this vicinity, just off to the corner here is where the rail or the transit station is to be built. <clears throat> How many are aware that maybe one day you might see rail? <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, RTD and the city are currently working on proceeding with improvements to start bus rapid transit service at that particular location, which would be back to Boulder. <clears throat> and they are looking to actually start the full service, I believe, around 2023 is their due date on that. Again, this is just another perspective, that whole intersection there, river off to the left. Did she get this to work? Again, this actually delineates the park or natural area boundary. This is a privately held parcel. This is the event. This is the event center here, and then this is kind of a residence in the back. <clears throat> and then this is the strip of undeveloped land that's currently owned by the city. And then this particular strip is owned one by a developer property owner out of Boulder, and he leases the property to the various businesses. Right now, this is a rental center right here. Again, kind of the uh, uh, collection of salvage and storage in this area. River improvements currently underway. And could we, could you go back to the river one? So just to show you the dimensions. So the mobile home park boundary actually was this line at one time right through here. Now the delineation is way back here. So this whole area has been added as part of that area to be preserved as natural area. And as a result, the river moved this way, which enhanced this area here as part of that natural area too. Tony, would you show where the transit center is on the next one? Yeah. So the transit center is actually to be put in this location right here. And so you can see it's not a far distance to Boston and the river itself. So it's a great opportunity to attract development in this particular area for two reasons. One being the rails or the transit station. And two is the river itself is also a, a, a very attractive enhancement for or to attract the development community. Okay, so now this is Main Street. And this kind of gives you that character that we currently have along Main Street proceeding to downtown. This effectively is the edge of downtown right here. And this is the project currently underway uh, by Brian's company, uh, South Main. <clears throat> and again, the transit station is due to be built in this location here. With the uh, intent is that Kaufman Street will be extended between Boston and First Avenue. Again, just another perspective, Main Street, Boston. <clears throat> you will notice even in this area, there's a lot of storage and salvage operations currently. And then this particular piece is the uh, hardware store, the large hardware store, <clears throat> that we anticipate could be there for a prolonged period of time. Are you talking about the 
talking about budget? Yeah, budget. Thank you. <clears throat> so this here is South Pratt. Here's the river corridor here. The enhancements occurring in this area and also significant enhancement occurring in this area up here. So this whole river area is being widened rather substantially beyond what it was originally. <coughs> and then just the rail station is due to be in this area here. And you can see kind of the collection of enterprises we have in this particular area there. Just another perspective, this is looking kind of southeast. And then this gives you a, a perspective southeast looking back to at, actually at the river. And you will notice the river is substantially uh, located rather far away from Boston. And with the exception of this little parcel in here, this is all preserved for that open space and uh, nature area. Drone had a bad day. It was semi cloudy that day, wasn't it? <laughs> Just to let you know, the day we decided to fly the drones is when the snow decided to come in. So we had to work around it. Um, wait, back to that one. So again, this gives you a better view of Boston Avenue. This is first main rail station in this particular, or the transit station in this particular location. And this shows the relationship of that corridor to the river rather well. And the significance here is we have a substantial development that is in closer proximity to the river than anything that would occur in this particular area here. And this stuff being relatively new is likely not to go away anytime in the near future. Just more perspectives of what we have. And again, that's looking south towards the river. There's the river right there. Okay. Where, where was that? Was it a substation that we just kind of breezed over? Uh, yeah, if you want to come back. Where was that? Okay, um, maybe hold on. There's a photo here. Is that it? No, it's a uh, scroll back. Okay, there it is. That's a good perspective. So here, this is the uh, cheese importers. So it's west of that. And it's west, okay. immediately west. This is Kaufman Street, where it currently dead ends. <clears throat> and uh, this is the electrical substation that's in this area. And the one thing to, that's important too is not only the substation, but the power lines actually run diagonal through here and then come through this part right here. So there's some constraints as to what we can actually build in this area here. And I think, uh, let's just... Yeah, sure. Okay, so in that, uh, in the foreground there, the is the uh, sugar beet factory and where Boston oh. then ends at uh, Martin Street, just east of that. Right, right, right here. Uh, I think it's worth the building of what that is and what it's. Oh yeah, so this this is the this is the sewer plant, the sanitary plant. And so that lagoon there is part of that facility. <clears throat> and then so the river is here, and the treatment goes on here. So this is the treatment plant, and then this is the sugar mill the Longmont Sugar Mill out on the periphery of town. Okay, let's go continue scrolling on. And we almost done through the areas. Any more questions on the gen general conditions, perspectives based on the aerials? Okay. <clears throat> so now what we did is, we t again, what we did is we looked at this looked at land ownerships, layouts, and so forth, <clears throat> and came up with, and then took the notes from the last meeting, and kind of laid in here a potential redevelopment of this whole area over a very long period of time. So it's not something that's gonna happen overnight, maybe totally within 10 years. This really looks at something maybe 30 years out before you would have a full redevelopment of this particular area here. And just to let you know, one of the big challenges is, is trying to attract development into this area 
there are cost factors and there are perception factors. So part of the challenge is, is I don't want developers saying I don't want to build a nice building in the middle of an area that doesn't give me a good return, right? So that's part of the challenge of development. That's why we envision development that could take a prolonged period of time because you've got to get those first projects in place and thereafter hopefully other projects come along. And so, you know, we can applaud Brian that he's actually taken initiative to build something that will lead to other interests in development in that area there. Um, so what we're going to do is it's going to go through showing how development might occur, how we envision, myself and Daniel envision, development might occur and that would incorporate some of these elements that were brought up in that particular meeting. So what's this being the trans or the transit station area? There's actually a real significant opportunity, this being Main Street, this being first. There is significant opportunity of a development or two occurring in this area here in the relatively near future. <clears throat> and with that, it is showing density, uh, rather high density, uh, particularly because we're looking at structured parking and support of both the commuter element for the transit station and any development itself. So there's a, there's a uh, desire on the development side to get density uh, around those particular facilities there. And the idea being too is you want to try to promote the transit center as a pedestrian opportunity. And with that, you want to give opportunities for people to live in close proximity, if not immediately adjacent to that facility. So that would be phase, looking at phase one. The second opportunity that may present itself is actually where the Royal Mobile Home Court used to be. Um, just in the fact that the city does own this portion of the property, <coughs> um, this envisions a development that would preserve that 150 foot setback from the river. Okay, can you tell me what the city owns again? It's not clear. They me. actually own, so if you took Kaufman Street and jaunt, just a little jaunt over and then extended, uh -huh. so from that point all the way to South Pratt. So it's this whole triangulated piece right here. Now it's about immediately after the flood. So that's all it was part, road. so yeah, this is a part of the, uh, the acquisitions for the, the storm improvements and then the storm improvements brought it up to this point here and then this was left as a remnant parcel that didn't really add any contribution to the, to the storm management. So there's an opportunity here, a couple opportunities. One here is possibly all uh, affordable housing, a portion of affordable housing. In this scenario, it's showing possibly a market rate product here, an affordable product here. The idea being that it makes the affordable product more uh, viable by using the market rate to help offset some of that cost differential. And then this particular piece, again, here's that event center. And then, as I mentioned, that one gentleman out of Boulder owns these <coughs> slivers here that are currently the rental the rental center and if you could those parcels combined actually could provide a nice development opportunity for someone <clears throat> and so we envision that that also may be a potential second phase of development uh, particularly when this gentleman is interested in doing something with his property other than what he has right now Then with enough residential development, there may be opportunity for a commercial retail combined with some uh, lower density residential there, townhomes, lower density apartments, condos, or something along that line. And so what happens out, we start filling out both ends of the corridor between the transit station here and the river here. And we start seeing that's filling in on both bookends here. Primarily because these are hard corners here, so 
parkour is very valuable to developers. <clears throat> Again, maybe that then leads to an additional multifamily or mixed use development. And then. What's the timeline, Tony, to have the, those areas that you just outlined out of the floodplain? Oh, out of the floodplain? Uh, pending some additional funding that, that the city's working on right now. Um, I do believe in Dale's here. Oh, I see. Huh? So the, the timing, um, right now, we're, it, once we finish the, the next stage that we're getting ready to go to get on, which is going to take us up through and under the, uh, the railroads, um, we're then going to sort of step back and see if we need to go back through the FEMA process to do what's called a, a letter of map revision process in order to redefine the floodplain. We do believe that um, some, some significant areas, but certainly not all of it, will we'll start to um, uh, be removed from the 100-year floodplain. And so that project is scheduled to go out to bid this year. Uh, my guess is construction will be in 2020, um, and it would be the 2021 time frame, um, probably at the earliest, that we would initiate that, that uh, process. That and, then, and then that, it's like two years, right? Process once you start. Yeah, the FEMA process is a good year, probably closer to 18 months, or uh, probably depends on how good you're going with your data and your information. But yeah. So, four or five years? Um, four, hopefully not five. But yeah. <laughs> and then, if you might be right, I just take your phone. No, I just, right? I'm just kind of ballparking. Yeah, four or five. Yeah, it's a way. But the, the, it doesn't necessarily, first of all, once it's out of the floodplain, some developers are willing to take risk for that short duration to get the mapping changed. The second thing, though, is... Well, most developers are going to need financing. The financing isn't going to come until it's out of the front row. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that. I'm saying but there are some, and I've actually talked to some out of state, that said that they've worked in floodplain areas that are nothing or more than what this is. But the other thing is, too, it doesn't prevent development from occurring because what's happening in the existing improvements are shallowing up some of that 100 year to the point that there might be opportunity to actually work with the 100 year floodplain. Okay. So, so it's kind of hard to say because it's, it's going to be site specific as to where that opportunity might lie in the short term versus the full blown map revisions and all. Yes. Yeah. It may not be completely appropriate at this time, but it, the, you had put these slides up here. Right. And so it triggers something. We are in a visioning process, a long-term visioning process. And so if, when this goes to the community, and we're talking about <coughs> and you're laying out slides that, that basically shows uh, concepts about developing soon, I think you're going to run into a potential uh, disconnect. Just like I'm having a bit of a disconnect with, if we're talking long-term vision, which mm -hmm. I thought is what we were doing in this committee, then I have a little trouble seeing all these little boxes being shown right now. So that's just me. Yeah, so what we're showing though, again, vision is something that you ultimately want to get to. To get to that vision usually is incremental steps. And what we're trying to do is show just incremental steps. That could happen. This in no way is saying this is what will happen, okay? So again, we're just laying forth. And that's why we didn't put any timelines to when this could occur. We're just seeing what we think might be the opportunistic progression of improvement in the area. Okay? And you, actually, you're going to have an exercise, I believe, here shortly. That's why you have these materials on the table here, to offer those type of, of uh, ideas and information. Okay? Okay. It just so everybody understands where I'm coming from. The council meeting last Tuesday, yeah. there was quite a ruckus raised over whether or not a vision or just checking that fire station out for possibilities turned into something far more and way ahead of where the public is. And that's all I wanted to point out. So no, no, that's fine. And I actually would love you to put that as a no as part of this next step of the exercise. Yeah. So along with that, so several of us, I mean, what I'm thinking is that there's some software that's pretty cool, right? That the city seems to like to use that in the past we've actually put up slides 
that it really made some people upset right. when there was no reason to because there was no plan, right? right. So this, th this, like when you look at this uh, map at your table, for example, or you look up there, there has been no conversation. There has been no approval. And my opinion, personally, one of seven on council and just one of 100,000 people in Longmont is that I share your concern that this is what could happen, but it's also one of one million different possibilities. Right. And so I personally believe that by doing this, it could trigger some things that we don't need to be talking about because that ain't going to happen. It will happen incrementally. And I think that really what it is, is if you want to come back and talk about, well, what would it look like? You can change it and move it and get a visual of what it would look like. Me personally, that's the only benefit of slides like this, is if you want to see what your individual vision would look like, civic center, uh, mixed use, housing. what? Low income, Low income housing, whatever, you can plug it into the software and get something that looks like this. You can also make it all park, and, and the software would, would do that as well. Well, I so, think that timing is perfect. I'm just, I just assumed that maybe we were going to, I, I, and, and that just looks like there's a little more, wait, your, a little com further than more. your comment was exactly the comment <coughs> I was fearful of when I said, why are we putting this map on the table? And why are we presenting the software? It's really cool software. But all it's going to do is lead to unnecessary angst in the community. So I want to speak up and say, this ain't going to happen. So just so you know. All right, go ahead. Yeah, again, just to reiterate, this was just designed to stimulate conversation. That's all it's about. Nothing's final in any capacity, nor is there anything that's going to be a final product out of this necessarily. OK? So tell me, I don't know if you've added this. So clearly right now, well, I don't like this here. You can delete it. And so that, that's the interaction of the software. That we had to have a baseline to sort of say, here are the points, and I don't know if you mentioned this at the beginning. We have a map where everybody stuck things and said, here's what we would like to see in certain areas. We merely took that information and plugged it in here, and then now you can work it out, you can put it in, you can do all sorts of things with that map. While we were looking at Harold, do what you just did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. take it all out. <laughs> so this is this right here. Yeah, it's not a static <laughs> project is, program. So this is, he's just showing what it could look like. I mean, we, we could put in anything you want. Okay, so. and uh, understand I'm trying to make sure this public process goes smoothly and that we don't go into a public process that it looks like a whole bunch of ideas have already been developed on the on there. We're visioning. And so that's all I wanted to make sure. To yeah, do. and I appreciate that comment. I do too. Yes, sir. Uh, Tony, related to this, um, just so to clarify our discussions here today, we're not necessarily focusing on this area. We're talking about possibilities for this area, if I'm correct. And our visioning exercise really wants to look at the entire river corridor and all of these relationships roll up. This is just an example well, and again, of one area. Is this was correct? a product from the last exercise we all did yes. where the sticky said we have we want to see this kind of feature, this, this, and this. And that's what we're just trying to show representationally in graphic form. Let's just put it that way, okay? And again, your your exercise is actually to, to just lay forth. You know, are we is this thing the wrong thinking? What's going on? Okay, so it's let's let's continue. Order. I want to get to the point where you guys can around your table continue no, no, the discussion. Nor is it just the river. This is not a meeting about the river corridor. It's a it's about the future vision of what Longmont will look like. We, we refer to it as B three and B four, the Longmont City, um, uh, well the Council Works Plan. It consists of Main Street. Uh, the, the sugar mill to, to just west of Hover. It consists of the opportunity zone. It consists of, it, it's about what Longmont will look like. It's not about first in Maine. It's not about the river. It's not about, it's, those are important pieces of an overall community vision. 
but we are not here specifically to talk about how we are going to, you know, uh, invade the same brain, if that makes sense. So again, Sandy has some pieces. I would also add that the maps on your tables are there for this feedback. So if something comes to you and you want to make sure that it's recorded, mm -hmm. grab those markers, write your stuff down, go ahead and start putting your feedback. If you, if you're, if, if we want to make sure that we get through the whole presentation so that you have more robust conversation about that. But if there's stuff that you want to make sure either is represented on that map or not, feel free. This is the feedback model that we're going to be taking in order to change what this looks like in the end. So again, the map on the table is big this map. area. Do you have a bigger map of the entire river? No, but you can take. You still put, can put notes on there mm -hmm. about other elements of that whole corridor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And to pick kind of a space. Yeah. Again, we're focused on where the concentration of the ideas came into play because we didn't have enough time to really look at the entire length. Okay? So again, this isn't the end of the process as I'm sure Councilor Waters would mention to you. Okay, so we're gonna run through these progression real quick because there's some critical elements here. Yes? Because uh, uh, well, Councilor Waters was gonna make another comment, but. No, I didn't, sorry, I didn't see. <laughs> there's something critical. I'll keep my mouth shut. But, because I'd like to move us, I mean, people got the idea. Right, what, what, okay. what the built environment might look like. Ultimately, what the built environment might look like should start with what this group thinks about. Right. And then give the community a chance to weigh in. So, if there's something critical, well, yeah, I'd like to make the shift as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, the critical elements are like popping up here and then. So, let's, we'll get to the critical pieces. So, go ahead. There's more potential development there. This is one of those critical ideas that evolved. And that was that some kind of conference facility, performance space, and how that would fit into the picture. So we're showing that this could be a conference, possibly a hotel that's part of that equation, and then a performance. The idea being with a parking garage that serves this whole complex here, so it's kind of a unit. Not that it necessarily has to be at this location, but the, just the general concept. Is this what you envision as part of that process? Okay, next one. It could involve a smaller residential community as part of the redevelopment. Next. More residential, possibly. And then the other thing was this particular area got that one yet? Okay. And so there was this talk about higher ed and uh, innovation space. The idea being this could be a campus of sorts, potentially a public institution here, space around it that would serve private interests and participation, and then the idea being again parking facility that serves not only this interest but particularly this interest too, which then minimizes the cost to build overabundance of parking in conjunction with that center. So what happens is this becomes kind of a critical hub. Where it is exactly, there could be numerous locations, but just the general concept. So again, we took your ideas, put them to paper, now this is where we want you to show us. So with that, we're going to do a quick fly through. What's east of that then? Which one, this? Yeah. Uh, just residential community, it could be. Preserving any natural feature that we have through the site, which we do. So if we could just do the fly over real quick, and then we can let yeah. her. They don't need it, tell me they can just start on the list. OK, it's up to them. It's, it's just a real quickie. Actually, we could just let it roll and he can start his piece if you want. Is that next? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Just about it. That's really nice. Work. That makes it very easy to see where you're talking about. Yeah. Right here. And we'd like to thank Daniel for his hard work on that, too. So. you heard today, look at the category and consider the area that you are in, the, the chosen um, 
focus area that you've sat with, folks that are looking at the same kind of thing. And put on the map things that you love, things you're concerned about, things you want to make sure the council considers as they continue through with this process. One thing to mention is that this isn't the only process that has happened in this area, right? We have a comprehensive plan, we have a major recorder plan that is happening. There's other input that's going to be going along. This is really your opinion. What do you think? What is your opinion around this map, these kind of concepts? There's sticky notes. I'm happy to have lots more sticky notes, lots more markers if you'd like some. I want you to write right on the map. What do you like? What are you concerned about? Um, what would you like to see changed before this goes out to the rest of the community? So we're going to take about 20 minutes to do that, and then we're going to stop, take a little break, and then we're going to ask you to write narratives around your vision for this area, and we'll hand out what those narrative examples look like. Any questions on the directions? Sorry, I have a question, but I apologize for missing the first part of it. Um, but everybody here probably knows that the Board of Trustees going to show you that after the break. We're going to take five minutes. Okay. Now that you're back at your table, Harold had an opportunity to kind of take a look around at some of the common things that you have seen so far. Not every single thing. We'll compile that and put that together a little differently. But Harold, why don't you and Daniel kind of go through what it is that you had taken from the group? So when we started out, I know uh, there were some questions of, is this the is this the vision? And we were saying, no, this isn't the vision. We needed a starting point to stimulate the conversations. And as you all were going through, you noticed us walking around and listening, and we were trying to then take those concepts from various tables real time and make those adjustments just to continually moving the conversation forward. I think we ended up just in this meeting today with four different options. I think so. Maybe five different options. Once we get a chance to read what everybody has written in the documents, we will probably generate another four to five options. And um, as we look at this, that may be a list of things that we start pulling out. And then when we go to the public, we very well could have another five to seven options as we're looking at this. So really quickly before you get to the next piece, one of the things, and I've got to figure out which one we're looking at. So. Um, we've heard different things today. So one of the first things we heard is we don't want, and this is pretty consistent around tables, is we really don't think single family residential needs to be this close to the wastewater treatment plant. So what you can see on this is they literally move the um, uh, higher ed performing arts center or the hotel performing arts center on that Mark Street Boston location. Uh, in this middle area, in this view, is more of a uh, mixed-use, multifamily concept, and then keeping mixed-use, multifamily on Main Street. Uh, can you show me the next slide? Uh, this is the first one, I believe. Oh, different piece that they change. We have more now. So you can see we moved that um, education to the west side of Main Street, Performing Arts Center there. And the only reason we're showing you this is because it's just reinforcing there's nothing fixed. We're trying to take all of these concepts and, and, and now visualize and 
provide them in a visual format. Can you show me the next one? One of the things we were hearing is about proximity to the river. And so um, he went in and mapped a distance. And so what you're seeing in this one is literally the same concept was maintained in that location. They just actually retracted that back a little bit in order to take some of the um, comments that were being made about proximity to the river. So you can see it kept the integrity of what was there. It was just minor adjustments to it. Uh, I think we've already So one of, the, one of the pieces, again, that really started coming up out of a lot of groups is that if we're gonna have a hotel convention center and if we're gonna have a performing arts center, that really needs to have a prominent place along Main Street. Okay. And so in this case, you can see it was in the middle. That concept was moved over into right off of Main Street where you see the same components that they talked about in the middle of the, at the beginning. That's now in Main Street. The mixed use piece was then moved to Martin and uh, Boston. And then the housing component was moved in the middle. And so everything that was on your original list is still in all of these visual concepts, but we were real time taking your feedback and creating different dynamics that you all, as you move into the next phase of this, when you start talking about writing your narratives and what your vision is going to be, you're, we're not just looking at this, we're looking at what you were discussing in this process what we can commit to you is we're going to take every one of these maps, start distilling this information, and then working on the next iteration of this in terms of here's the details to what we were generally hearing as we were moving around, eavesdropping on all of your conversations. Um, any questions about this? Did this help? Yes. Did, I mean, did this really help to understand I it wasn't fixed? So I still think that um, Martin, whatever is on that even if it's a mixed use building, I think that's going to be really tough overlooking that sewer treatment plant. We got a hotel being built over it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the beauty of what Daniel does. I mean, you know, we said this, this is different than what we've done in, in our community in these processes. Normally we have these conversations, we hear it, we go into our world, and then we come out with something. This was the first time we've really had the opportunity for you all to see how we take these concepts and start making those adjustments based on feedback from the community. There will be more to this. But anyway, I just wanted to go over to really reinforce that what we were trying to accomplish today. Very good, thanks, Earl. Okay, so, in the pursuit of what we're trying to accomplish today, you all have several pieces of blank paper on your tables. It's time to write the narrative around the topic that you chose. So this narrative is really, if you were to put your vision and everything that you talked about and everything you have in your minds together into a, a narrative that we can give to the public to help explain what we're talking about, our greatest desires in this category, so whether that be environment or climate, or whether that be land use or culture and arts, either one. So what, what I want for you to do is go ahead and do this either in bullet form. I mean, if you're, if you're suave enough to be able to write, write it in narrative form, that's awesome. I'm not, so sometimes bullet forms is a good way to get started because we'll be, of course, smoothing and editing before we give it to the public anyway. I have put down one example, so I asked him, I said, we're going to tell them to write a narrative, and the first thing they're going to say is, what are you talking about? What does that mean? So I asked Tim to put down, um, to write what he would do. And so for education, he did write his narrative piece. This is just an example for you to see what kind of level of conversation we're talking about. We're talking about vision, visioning statements, right? What do you want to see? What are your greatest hopes? We've talked a lot about greatest hopes. But for this area, for this particular topic, what are your greatest hopes for this? And so there's the example on your table. I have extras of those. If more people would like to have those, 
There's a blank piece of paper. You're welcome to continue to fill in your maps if you feel like you need to. We're going to spend about 20 minutes on this as a table. Marsha. You may decide that you want to start off writing something, you know, kind of initiative by yourself, but in the end, we want one per table, one per topic. That needs to incorporate kind of everything you talked about. I'm going to give you 20 minutes to do that. We'll kind of compare some notes, share your visions on each of these areas. Okay? Ready to go? Okay. We're going to share our visions, talk about next steps and the evaluation of this process thus far. So, I do believe Andy said he was dying to go first. Yeah, I just can't wait. In fact, Joni, do you want to just come grab this for me now? And then go Andy. So, um, one of the, th I'm part of uh, land use and we had Joni for a little bit and, and Gordon and Ben, and one of the things that we came up with was um, density, density, density. Like, no, no single family, um, probably finding ways to incentivize um, some development of that density first, because that's going to be a hurdle. Maybe utilizing um, uh, the publicly owned ground uh, to come up with some parking structures that maybe get that. Maybe. Do you want a laser? Sure. Thanks, Tom. So, I don't know why I was pointing the laser. I'm not really talking about any spot yet. They gave me the laser. So um, we, we do think th this is such an advantage to have this preserved greenway and having this beautiful area, making sure that we capitalize on it with um, mixed use and specifically not mixed use in any one, one building necessarily, but mixed use throughout that we have residential components and that we have, um, uh, especially along this corridor, restaurant or maybe some uh, entertainment uh, potentially there, depending on how it's, how it's utilized. And we, we came up with that, uh, that buffering along Martin because you've got our water treatment over here. So not having that residential component there, but potentially having your higher ed, uh, performing arts, conference center, hotel, um, mixed over there. Tell me, guys, if I'm missing one of our big ones. Grand entry. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, so coming in from the south, we believe that this is a really distinct neighborhood and that this should be some uh, very obvious grand entry. You have these beautiful view corridors off to the west here. You have uh, beautiful view corridors here, and you'll be entering this new kind of downtown entry. So this will be the new gateway to downtown coming from the south, and it should be obvious. Or stage for all, for sure. Yeah, Andy wants to build a penthouse suite right there. Yeah, and this is where uh, <laughs> this is where I'll retire, right there. I'll, I'll look right that way. Um, it was just trying to create that gateway going into Longmont. I feel like I missed another, another big one. Can we please move the uh, skyrise off the middle of the St. Ray River? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just as the guy who made me think in politics, and, and, you know, but we just destroy that right now. Oh, and we wanted to uh, uh, be be considerate of building massing. We think that leaving the flexibility of what these buildings actually are up to the individual developers is, is pretty key to getting new and innovative stuff going and getting the interest and investment. But being considerate of what our view corridors are going to be along here, that we don't have uh, building densities and, and heights just completely blocking out the St. Grain Corridor or or the mountains, but that we're thoughtful about that massing to preserve that while still achieving very high density. Very good. Good work. All right. Marsha looks ready. It's a lot of power, Marsha, but you're, you're ready for it. Well, you know, we actually didn't talk about buildings or locations that much. We talked about our buildings in the abstract. On the other hand, Every one of us 
us at this table is a great writer, so we have a lot of nice prose to read. Excellent. I'm very proud of them. So we, we, were, we said Longwood is Longmont because of its culture of inclusion. As we enhance the value of the public by creating cultural assets such as a higher education campus, a performing arts venue, convention centers, tech campuses, and resources, we need to employ our ingenuity to ensure that these public goods draw us together and do not work to separate us. The powerful can be enlisted to uplift and showcase the cultural richness of our many neighborhoods and subcultures. Management protocols need to be designed to preclude shutting out groups with less money. Community resources must allocate community time. Spaces must be designed for accessibility, flexibility to the public, and when possible, durability. We are all in this together. Let our vision acknowledge it. We envision the future where what began as a few nonprofit cultural and performing arts leaders shared the best practices and getting together a few times a year to support one another has turned into a natu nationally recognized community model for arts training leaders and training leaders in the arts. Longmont is now known in this vision for the future for its summer cultural institutes and year-round cultural arts events that appeal and attract performers from around the nation and thought leaders from around the globe. The pillars of this vision are equity for all residents, access for everyone, inclusion of all viewpoints and approaches, and above all, sustainability so that this vision can continue. If one would think of science, technology, engineering, and education as the mind of the community, and business and entrepreneurism as the muscle, the arts are the heart of the community. The facility itself becomes a physical symbol of the unique and personal artistic expressions that happen in the venue, making it an important part of both locally, regionally, and culturally of our identity. I think I garbled that last sentence. Sorry, Bob. You know, let Longmont be Longmont. Very good. I love it. I forgot to grab yours, Andy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, how about our back table there? Yeah, come on around. <laughs> you want that? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our table discussed business development. Um, we talked about taking advantage of the natural beauty that's um, in this area that's going to be along the river uh, to be able to have uses um, that are like, um, I don't know, like a class A office space, uh, maybe like a mini source like they have um, down in Denver in that area. Uh, we talked about the importance of having some catalyst projects um, such uh, right along the main street area, which was, yeah, so long here, um, that performing arts center, um, the importance of having high quality architecture to try and attract um, and kind of be the catalyst for other things that could come. Um, having some mixed use there along Main Street. Uh, <coughs> let's see here. Over, um, let's see, go east. <laughs> okay, we talked about how definitely not to have single family residential <laughs> here. Um, the use that we identified that was missing is kind of like a light industrial use, something like the Tinker Mill has to be able to have that kind of use and that might be a nice buffer um, because of all the more heavier industrial stuff that's going on over here with recycling and that sort of thing to be able to transition and to make sure we don't overlook that land use. Uh, let's see. Um, we like the idea of the hotel, um, boutique hotels and restaurants that would need to be near where the Performing Arts Center was to be able to support that. Um, the importance of east-west multimodal connectivity through the whole area. Um, and also 
also the importance of having affordable housing interspersed um, with the mixed use to make sure that there's folks that are going to work in the retail businesses and that sort of thing that they can live um, down in this area as well. So those are, I think, all the concepts we covered. you had a slight leg up. <laughs> Our group was education. And we began by taking a step back and saying, we're not really concerned and don't want to spend time on the buildings. What we wanted to talk about was what are we trying to accomplish in this Longmont and perhaps physically put it somewhere in this area. But we talked about creating a public-public-private partnership. Public the city, public the universities and colleges and others, both in Colorado and outside, and of course, uh, private entrepreneurship and so on. And we uh, were the kids who had somebody else do our homework for us. So Tim wrote a piece that sort of outlined it, but what we really did is talk about what does that look like? What does that public-private partnership look like? It's multi-groups coming together to create a center for entrepreneurship and solutions that can drive business and community growth both locally and nationally. So we might have CSU, CU, UNC, MIT, anybody who wants to have access to education, learning. The second part of what we talked about was lifelong learning, so that it should focus on pre-K all the way through senior citizens who want to go back to school or want to take courses for intellectual stimulation, whatever it be. We also talked about that it has to be easily accessible throughout the city. Um, some of the things that we talked about is we want to incorporate Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, companies who are looking for, for example, um, Mike suggested that Panasonic has a problem. They can't find enough people to do what they need. So we would be some sort of flow for them. Uh, it would have easy access to all the buildings and so on, whatever it looked like. The second part of what we talked about was the inherent disconnect or competition between showing the public a map like this where it creates the impression that this is what's going to happen yeah. and they're reacting to it versus encouraging creative thinking by talking about this as a general area and saying these are the kinds of things we want to include Okay, public, what do you want to have included in that? And that was the reason I asked about the question about the process. Because I think there's, there's a problem in that this kind of map creates inertia. And it creates a conflict with the ability of people to think creatively. Because they're going to respond to what they see. And they may not even realize it. that's what they're doing. So I think we have to be very careful in how we present these maps, and you may not even want to present them until later on in the process. But if you want the community to be creative and engaged in this process, you've got to do it in a way that reduces the barriers. These kinds of things, I think, increase the barriers. Um, we want to make sure that whatever we do takes into account that we need to be aware of and focused on changing from fossil fuels, climate change has to be a high priority, those kinds of things. Um, and we want to create an area where there's public meeting spaces available and accessible to the community. One of the problems in this town is that if you're a nonprofit, for example, you have a hard time finding a place to meet unless you have your own space. And with the conference center going away, uh, it's going to get even more difficult. So we want to have public access 
to these facilities. If they're educational facilities, like Front Range, for example, their spaces are available to the public as needed. Um, lots of entry and exit points so that uh, can be a variety of uh, uh, ways to get there. And I think that's it. Okay. Very good. I'm going to let Daria talk about her. She was over in the other group, and I made the other group disperse because writing a vision about others seems a little not as much fun as writing one about environment and climate. So, Daria? Okay. We mostly did ours in bullet points because we want to be succinct. Um, we talked about space for startup companies so that there can be some innovation. Um, we, we like the idea of integrated green areas throughout, and that would also include uh, like over and underpasses to avoid the trains, and also walking and biking connectors from downtown to the park and recreation areas to kind of integrate all of that. Um, Diverse architectural styles was something we thought was important. Uh, and low income housing, maybe instead of single family houses. Um, and someone thought of a river corridor with boating structures for businesses and living. I'm not exactly clear on that. Um, another area was space for food and truck type businesses so that small startup people can come in and have a little input there. Um, I like the idea of education and business and government collaboration spaces, kind of like uh, convention areas or small meeting spaces. Um, possibly a height cap. I spoke to someone who said there might be a seven-story height cap, which I wouldn't have a problem with. I don't know how anybody else feels about that. Um, and more underground parking with above-ground business and living units above the parking structures. Just basically that. Very good.
three to four story more garden style walk up with surface parking, and then you tear down into townhomes, or you tear down into row homes, and maybe there's pedestrian access into those homes, like they have the street, like a, the front door aligns with the street in a portion. So there's many ways to just kind of break up that massing and create, you're almost creating a community within a community. So um, let's see, what were some of my other things here? Oh, and then I already brought this up, but buffering Martin with, uh, you know, like, I don't know if it's called light industrial or manufacturing or something there, but we just last <coughs> night we went to a local distillery in an industrial area of Boulder. But they had like a cool tasting room. Next door was a chocolate manufacturer. They have a little tasting room too, but it's just really neat. You still have that sense of community, but you're supporting local business and you're buffering out what's well, kind of an eyesore, you know, on the other side. <laughs> so, yeah, no one wants to live by that. Uh, let's see. I hate public speaking, so bear with me. Um, and I think that's it. And I think our, our other big thing was create the wow factor, create the visual candy, create something where we all drive by and we feel proud of what, you know, what was created. You know, and I think there's a huge opportunity here, and there's amazing ideas, and um, you know, it's just trying to get everyone on board, you know, with the vision, with a shared vision. So that's our little spiel. Very good. <laughs>
Uh, B, our, the 150-foot riparian conservation buffer has been maintained all along the length of our St. Frank corridor. C, our open space sales tax has been put in perpetuity via a 2020 ballot measure and it has been increased for long-term flood recovery, including land acquisition and maintenance of all open space properties. And then in terms of this development that we looked at today and future development through the corridor, um, this would be the best state of the art, low impact development using reused and sustainable materials powered by renewable energy sources, is aesthetically pleasing and compatible with the culture and climate of the greater Longmont area, uh, it would be eliminating the negative impacts of noise and light pollution, minimizing asphalt by utilizing parking structures versus ugly parking lots, lots of green space within and around developments, including rooftop gardens, and a vibrant science and nature senator, center in this corridor that is accept, accessible to our entire Longmont community from birth to death to foster mental health, physical wellness, and lifelong learning. <laughs> what amazing vision statements, what amazing narrative. So as you know, as we've talked about, our next step is to take this information out to the community. I know that this table talked a little bit about things that we need to be cautious of. I also want to state, though, that people have a hard time reacting to what they can't see. And even though I know that everyone had different reactions to seeing the maps, that's the reactions that we want to know about. Did you love it? Would you love it more if it looked like something different? To some extent, to, to see it is to understand it. At the same time, there may be lots of other ways for us to be able to engage the community. So I just want to take just our last five minutes here to talk about any other feedback that you have about this process or about things that we should know uh, as we move forward. One other thing that you should know as we move forward is that the council and their conversation about the Main Street Corridor plan connected these two because this is clearly part of that. This is one segment of what the Main Street Corridor plan looks like. So you'll be starting to see stuff under that umbrella with this effort. They'll still be listed separately so people can understand that they are different, but there's an intersection here that's important too. So just I want you to know that's going to be part of the public involvement process as well. So what other things do you want us to know as we go to take some of this information out to the public? And what evaluation do you have of this process so far? We'll start there and then go to the I'm still frankly confused as to what the area is that we're talking about. I don't think it's been well defined <coughs> as far as I'm concerned. And since I don't spend my day uh, working on these issues, this is secondary to me, I think you need to define it so people know what you're talking about. Okay, define them. I mean, I've heard all these phrases, opportunity zones, and Main Street yeah. development, so it, it's confusing, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's lots of overlay. As we saw in the first meeting, there's tons of overlay yeah. in that. Yeah. Marcia. Um, I'm rather than, than uh, uh, having open, uh, have, having flat maps that are, that are printed, I think it would be great if we had, um, had a carnival ride uh, kind, of, kind of thing where we would let uh, a number of people into the charrette uh, merry-go-round space or something, and we would start with with a, a map with nothing on it. We had those, you know, those rubber squishies that you can 3D print and people put things where they want to. You know, the only thing you would, the only thing that you, you would be demarked to where it would be where something could happen versus where something is already already there. Cut it to set it stand, and I think that might address the argument. Of, yeah, these are the elements of the vision. Where do you think they should go? And and you know have have ad hoc teams and people that would come together and do it. We photograph it and then we knock everything off and start again. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I think in relationship to that, I think uh, <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of wonderful ideas, wonderful vision come out of the process, but. By and large, um, a lot of this is coming from a community that is uh, not necessarily at the level of what I consider a systems thinking professional. Uh, somebody like the Brookings Institute, Bruce Katz has spoken in town before. I'd love to see him come back. 
and talk about the bigger, from a systems thinking, how these ideas can come together to create the kind of uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem and innovation economy and living learning laboratory and environmental protections and all of these ideas being synthesized together through a professional third party consultant like a so Bruce Katz has a just formed a group called the Global Institute for Innovation Districts. And they're helping communities create exactly what we're trying to do, but they're really acting as facilitators for groups like us and ideas like this to come together in a very meaningful way that looks at the whole system of the city, how you protect the environment, create affordable housing, public safety, all the things we're looking at. Great, thank you. I'm just going to add, so uh, uh, from my perspective, the uh, I think the ability to come together and, 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 and have aspirational visions of what's possible, um, that's what I think generates excitement. Uh, in the community. Too often, we start worrying about the nuances of, well, how's that going to happen? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And I guarantee half, half the things around us would have never come about had people started with that frame of thought. So I think if I'm understanding, and I don't know if I understand the whole process, either because I'm not in the middle of that, but if you start aspirational and you start with big, darn uh, visions of what's possible, um, if you don't start out overly constrained out of the shoot. And that, I think, is a great way to go to the community and at least start that engagement. And I, I hope that's what we're heading towards. <laughs> <laughs> job of facilitating these yeah. first two sessions. And, and so, you know, I, I said this the last time, you could be anywhere today. Everybody in this room could be anywhere you want to be doing whatever you want to do other than this. The fact that you show up to do this is such a statement. It honors what we're trying to do as a city, but it's, it's such a statement about how, what you think about and how you care about this community. So you should give yourselves a round of applause as well. Um, so just a couple of observations and then just uh, kind of next steps. The first one is this, uh, you know, if I put my educator hat back on, um, you know, one of the things we talked about in those days a lot about was uh, learning stops when a question is answered, right? You stop the, the whole process. So today isn't about trying to answer a question. It's hopefully to stimulate the learning, right? We're a long way from answering questions. But hopefully we're going to continue to learn together until we get to the point where we feel like we're ready to come to a conclusion. And that's going to be a ways off, number one. Number two, the last time I was in this room two weeks ago today was for a, a 
city council retreat. So the staff members who are in the room, who were in the room for that retreat, and the council members who are sure here, will remember in the run up to that, we all spent some time on the Gallup Corporation's website going through their strengths finder assessment, which is a whole series of prompts, uh, the response, the result of which kind of in, informs us what our natural gifts are when we come to anything, but especially sessions like this. And I'm, as I'm sitting and listening, I'm mindful of the fact that in this room and in this community, all 34 of the Gallup strengths, council members and others, are gonna show up in significant ways as we take the result of this work to the community. So we have to do it in a way that gives everybody a chance to bring their gifts into the process and have us be as um, engaged as they want to be in helping, get, helping us get to the point where we have an answer to our questions. So moving forward, uh, you should anticipate seeing these opportunities for you and the community to be engaged with this process. Uh, it's not on the calendar yet. Our target is to have materials ready sh to share by May 1st, right? So the reference last time to Cinco de Mayo was simply a placeholder. Let's make certain by May 1st we had a chance to pull all this together in a way that's consumable by the public. You should expect following May 1st in this venue, in the library, in the senior center, as well as our community events like Cinco de Mayo and like Rhythm on the River. But between May 1st and probably the middle of August, we're going to create multiple opportunities for people to not just to react, but to contribute, to engage. And hopefully, as I said earlier, whatever vision emerges, the whole the nature of a shared vision it is it's not one that's shared with the public, it's one that's shared by the public, right? That people own. So there are going to be a lot of opportunities to do that personally on, on the agenda with uh, the Neighborhood Group Leaders Association in May. So for any of you who are in HOAs and your, your representatives are at NGLA, the offer is going to be to take that presentation to HOAs, to neighborhoods, in addition to venues like this. And hopefully we'll get to the point where uh, we might have multiple vision statements and people having a chance to say, I like parts of this and parts of that. And, and do their own synthetic work to bring something together. In addition to that, and I suspect where these, all of these materials are going to reside is on pound the table. So it's bang, a new bang the table. Bang the table. Bang the table. <laughs> Jump the on table. the table. Oh, that <laughs> bang the table. We're going to call it bang the table. Bang the table. So just two, thirty seconds, Sandy, yes. and, and what that's going to look like. Yeah. Absolutely. So engage long not will be a website that is powered by Bang the Table, where we put lots of different projects and programs on there in order to not only create a place where people can watch videos about it, but also can contribute their ideas either through surveys or interactive mapping tools or all sorts of stuff. It's not the only way, but it is just one more tool that we'll use as part of this engagement process. We launch it hopefully April 1st. So, so in addition to face-to-face -face interactions, there's going to be a chance for people to engage virtually. Yeah. Uh, mark on your calendars, this will be tentative. Um, so, I, you know, I, we've talked about dates in September. Friday, uh, September 13th. Now, Friday the 13th may be a bad day to do this. But, but September 13th is a Friday. Uh, put a placeholder, will you, on Friday that morning. As the th we, we asked you for your commitment to three sessions. The third session now, just tentatively, Friday the 13th of September, where we'll have a chance to bring all the input we get from the community back to you on that occasion with the question to you, what's going to be required of the city? So the question, what kind of collective action do we have to take? Part of that's going to be what your city council needs to consider doing, whether it's policy, land code, public engagement, whatever you think a council should seriously or should take seriously as their role and responsibility for moving this forward. The intent would be to have that polished from you and ready to present to the current council before this council does finish, finishes their term, right? There'll be a new council elected in November. So this council probably ain't gonna take action on anything other than to shepherd the process along and get it to the point where we can hand it, this council can hand it off to the next council. And then that council can decide what they want to do with it. But if it's robust enough, clear enough, compelling enough, um, this is a once in a multiple generation, multi-generation opportunity, right? The flood that came through here and did such devastation, the net of that is an opportunity that won't come along again to get it right. 
in terms of the environment, education, uh, the, the kind of culture we're wanting to go <coughs> on. So in the interest of getting it right, we want to, we want to take advantage of what you bring and then give the next council a chance to, to execute. So on the 13th of September, we're going to ask you to generate action steps. You'll get a chance to react to what people have brought to you, the communities, you know, given to you as their input. You'll get a chance to generate a set of action steps you'd like to see presented to the council. Council will receive those. This council is simply going to acknowledge the work and get it ready to hand off to the next council. Last thing I'll say is, kind of where we started uh, in, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the spirit of DHOC, right? Uh, the visions, the, what I heard was pretty bold and, and creative today, just to reinforce what Sandy said. I think incrementalism is a, would be a problem, not a solution. So Dale's comment about let's, you know, let's think bold and big and, and as systemically as possible. And if we know, if we fail to get it all realized, that is not, the, that's not the shortfall. Failure is for this group in the community to sell ourselves short of what's possible. So. Failing to realize, to, to envision the possibility is the shortfall, not failing to accomplish it. Thank you. God bless you. Be safe and warm. We'll see you again in September.